Hi everyone, and welcome to Human Stories. My name is Francesca D'Amico Cuthbert, and I am the Community Engaged Early Career Fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto. My research examines the history of Toronto hip hop and the rap scene in this city and its relationship to Canada's popular music marketplace and its meticulous rituals of power. Today, I will be talking about the development of the Toronto hip hop scene, which developed in the mid to late 1970s among Toronto youth communities racialized as black, as well as those who identified as new migrants and first generation Canadians across a range of ethnic and racial boundaries and those overwhelmingly classed as the working class and working poor. Toronto hip hop was initially associated with four distinct neighborhoods in the city that included the Jane and Finch Corridor, Scarborough, Regent Park, and Flemington Park. Many hip hop practitioners have argued that this fourth neighborhood, which was located in the Don Mills area of the city, was considered neutral territory, where artists and fans would congregate together for live performances, competitions, outdoor parties, or what were referred to as blocos. Over the course of the scene's first three decades, Prominent hip hop artists, most of whom identified as black and Caribbean descended, used the genre to creolize their locales and engage in diasporic conversations that reached beyond the Canadian border to the places of their family's origin. In focusing on their local environment of Toronto, hip hop artists also made it a practice to actively claim Canadian space as their own. This is particularly evident in the 1990s when Toronto MC K-Force affectionately renamed the city the T-Dub. As American hip hop culture popularized in the 1970s and the 1980s, Toronto youth recall that they first accessed hip hop by visiting family members in New York City, that is hip hop's birthplace, and bringing back cultural artifacts such as vinyl. Youth would then circulate this material at live events such as house parties or what were known then as basement jams, as well as outdoor parks, school dances, community centers, and high rise building party rooms. As hip hop popularized and Toronto based artists honed their own talent and their own scene, college radio and music television played an incredibly important role in popularizing the artistic output of Toronto's burgeoning scene. While most Toronto fans first heard rap music via Buffalo, New York's radio station 93.7 WBLK FM radio, this dial was often subject to a lot of static given its distance from Toronto. By 1982, radio personality Ron Nelson would develop the Fantastic Voyage, which was Toronto's first hip hop college radio show hosted on Ryerson University's 88.1 CKLN FM from 1 to 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoons. Nelson was also responsible for nurturing the growth of a local live performance scene. Among the most notable of his events were a series of hip hop competitions or what fans called monster jams. The most famous of which was New York Invades Toronto, a series of battles where Nelson pit local talent against established American rappers such as Biz Marquis and Roxanne Chante. By creating this performance infrastructure, Nelson informally nurtured a groundswell of local talent in the first decade of Toronto hip hop history in acts such as Rumble and Strong, The Get Loose Crew, Maestro Fresh West, and Mishy Me. Artists also agree that Much Music, Canada's first music television station, played an invaluable role in circulating Toronto hip hop across and beyond Canada's borders. Artists credit television series such as Soul in the City, Rap City, Extend a Mix, and Electric Circus as providing artists with a platform across the country as well as beyond its borders, particularly as these programs were syndicated in other international markets. Over the course of my research, I have discovered that while Toronto hip hop practitioners use the genre to circulate their local narratives, distinct inflections and diasporic experiences, artists were consistently dealing with a series of gatekeeping practices that made it difficult to conceptualize, produce, promote, and profit from their art. 
In the absence of significant financial supports, popular culture visibility, and an infrastructure for hip hop in Canada to thrive, many artists left for the United States in search of major recording contracts. These realities were exacerbated by industry-wide attempts in Canada to collapse hip hop into one niche market titled urban music that confined a range of black music formats. Artists and cultural critics have argued that this term masked and rebuffed the diversity of black music in Canada within one mega genre that then described away the race of its artists. Along with this exclusionary practice, one known as narrow casting, Toronto artists were subjected to a series of covert and explicit instances of anti-Black racism and market segmentation that unfairly disadvantaged Black artists and curbed the individual and collective opportunity of Toronto hip hop culture in both the domestic and international marketplace. By examining the careers of a number of artists, as well as their engagement with recording studios, music labels and sales, broadcasting regulations, as well as the accolade system, I have found that Black artists continually encountered industry-wide instances of homogenization, stereotyping, underrepresentation, exclusion, disinvestment, surveillance, and outright erasure from the national marketplace. The history of hip hop's systematic marginalization within Canada's culture sector, one rooted in a much longer sense of history of race relations in Canada, ultimately resulted in efforts to undermine the realization and potential of a hip hop infrastructure in Canada. Despite the various challenges that Toronto artists encountered in their attempts to establish a hip hop infrastructure within Canada, over the course of the scene's first three decades, they did find some success by resisting power formations within the Canadian marketplace. One such example includes the rise of independent recording labels such as East Park Productions and Treehouse Records, which help artists generate revenue and visibility in and beyond Canada while also ensuring that they retained intellectual and artistic control over their materials. Artists then worked with community and college radio, as well as advocates at Canada's music television station to generate grassroots visibility and patronage for their local scene, in spite of the lack of financial support and marketplace exposure from major record labels and commercial radio. The story of Toronto hip hop demonstrates the ways in which artists mobilized a set of resistive practices in order to nurture and sustain a local scene that retained its own narrative possibilities, practices, and inflections. But perhaps most importantly, the story of Toronto hip hop helps us think critically about how ongoing popular culture and music history tropes of artists in need, deprived or solely at the will of the dominant white industry work to deny artists their agency while also obscuring the fact of the powerful networks and infrastructures that they too create and sustain in spite of the meticulous rituals of power deployed by power brokers meant to undermine their success. Thank you so much for listening today. I do hope you enjoyed learning about the early history of Toronto hip hop. For additional Human Stories videos and the associated blog, please do visit humanstories.ca and subscribe to the project's YouTube channel. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I you know, I sometimes do this and do that.